Crossword ENTV is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country. Over the course of this episode, we will, of course, be learning about who our guest is and what drives them, but we'll also be learning about how they're working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there and works there. And today we are honored to be sitting down with Brazo County, Alberta Councillor Cara Westerlund. But before we get into the interview with the counselor, I just want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Municipalities don't often get the limelight as our federal and provincial counterparts do. And I'm hoping that with this show, people are realizing that municipalities truly do matter. So if you can, hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews with municipal leaders from across Canada. Now, on to their interview. Kara, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. And I want to start with A, long time no see. Uh, for those who remember, we had uh, Kara back on the show after the provincial election. So we thought we'd bring her back onto the show but to talk about herself and her duty to serve. So I want to start with that question, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Kara? You know, that is a, it's a soul searching question. Um, and I've been asked that often. I've been on, um, on council and fortunate enough to be elected fourth term. So I've been serving for 14 years. Um, but I'm going to take you way, way back to when I was a little girl. Um, I grew up on a farm in the area of Brazu County. Um, and I'm actually a very, uh, very proud 4-H member. So um, if you are aware of that program, um, it is very much about giving back to your community, very much uh, learning a sense of community. So from a very young age at nine years old all the way till I was 19 um, I was with that organization and I and I truly believe that sense of of, of community duty um, came from my experience um, in growing up in the 4-H world so uh, taught me a lot about 4-H uh, about a lot about public speaking um, I have picked uh, hundreds of miles of garbage out of the ditch that keeps you humble when you're cleaning up other people's trash out of the out of the ditch um and the program itself um is very community orientated so i have to honestly say way back from when i was a little girl i think it's something that's been instilled in me for a very long time so while i don't know well i, I never uh, went into the 4-h club i do know people who went through it i know there is a sense of public speaking that you do there's a lot of uh, agricultural shows that you do so how does someone from a 4-h club become a counselor for their community well, take me through that journey was politics discussed as a young age where you got the interest and it just ran with it or how did you come to a run in an election in 2010 well, funny story. Um, absolutely not. My background, actually, I have a diploma in broadcasting. So um, at a very young age, at 16, our local radio station allowed me the opportunity to, um, I was a weekend news anchor, uh, so mm. sports weather and news at 16, um, very early mornings, often in the office at four o'clock in the morning, um, and, a, and a dedication and commitment there. So actually, that's my background. I worked in media for about 10 years. Um, it brought me back to the community in, I would say about 2006, it brought me back into uh, the Brazu County and Drayton Valley area. Um, and I was actually covering local politics um, through my uh, through my job as the news director at the local radio station. And that's what really piqued my interest. Um, there were some issues going on in the community. Um, the big one at the time was a swimming pool in our community was up for debate. <laughs> um, and there was zero support at the time on the rural side, which I lived in um, and was and grew up in and was now raising my family in. And I thought, you know, hey, you're not speaking for everybody in the community when, you know, the, the no to the swimming pool had come. So um, actually, to be honest with you, it doesn't get much rural than this. We were literally around the campfire one Friday night uh, having a couple of beverages. And I was talking with my friends and someone's like, well, isn't there an election coming up? Like, you know, if you feel so strongly about this, why don't you throw your name in? So at the tender age of 26, I uh, had less than 48 hours to uh, get the signatures required, um, basically get my poop in a group. Um, and I filed. I had zero idea what I was in for, what I was doing. <laughs> Um, but by the grace of my community, the minute I filed my paperwork, um, my phone didn't stop ringing um, and people offering their support, giving me the guidance that I needed to get through the election. Um, so I literally jumped in feet first, no second guessing. I just, that's how I run in life. I just go in, you know, doing 250 miles an hour. I'll figure it out as we go. Um, and I was very fortunate to win um, in, in 2010. Um, and uh, 
the people must must believe and, and see something in me because I'm still standing. So, and it's been 14 years and every single day I get up, um, it's my passion, it's my drive. It's it's about helping my community and it's, um, yeah. I'm, I, I often say I'm raising my family here. I am doing business here and um, it's just, it's a, such a strong com- uh, connection with the community, so. So that 2010 election, it seems like it- it kind of was a experience in itself because you, you file your paperwork, you run, you win. But the, the thing that you forget, and I'm, I'm not sure you, you I'm, I'm certain you don't forget, but you don't mention is you go up against an incumbent in I the did. election and in municipalities, that is a unique beast to go up against a, an incumbent and defeat an incumbent. And I, I mean that with respect. I, I don't know the person you defeated, but just to go up against someone like that. Um, for you, was there any apprehensions around that aspect of putting your name forward, saying, OK, I, 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 I it's a small community. I, I might know this counselor. I might know this person. And I'm going to put my name forward to run against them. You know, Ian, you hit it on the head. It is a small community. So yes, I knew I knew the the individual I was running against, I believe, uh, 18 plus years um, on council um, when I decided to put my name in. Um, but it, it's really important when you decide to run for these roles, you're and in my case, and in my circumstances, I wasn't running against the person I was running for the position. Yeah. And I was running for that opportunity to represent my community in that role. Um, so it was yeah, you it, it was difficult. And it was um uh, once I realized, um, it, it is a difficult task to take an incumbent out, like you said. Um, but I door knocked, I pounded pavement, uh, left, right and center. I made it a goal of mine to hit every single door in my community, um, and, and meet people face to face. Um, and I knew that was important. I know that's really important in rural Alberta is that face to face and that relationship building. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very much an extrovert. Um, I'm very approachable. Uh, and, uh, so it, it was actually, regardless of what the results were in 2010 for the results, um, I had learned so much. Um, and I was, I was becoming a better person every day um, with the type of conversations and um, the door knocking that was happening. So win or lose at that point, it was still a win in my books. So you, you've been successfully elected once and reelected three times in 2013, 2017, and 2021 reelected, mm-hmm. which encompasses 14 years in municipal politics. And it's an interesting question I always pose, but you get to answer it in a different way because you've been there for such a an extended period of time. How much has municipal government changed over the last 14 years as a councillor and as a council as whole? What has been the biggest change that you have seen that you weren't dealing with in 2010 when you first got elected, but now it seems like you're dealing with it on a regular basis in 2023? Well, you know, the big one that instantly comes to to my mind, obviously, my community was hit hard by the wildfires this spring. Um, in the past, we had had uh, two previous fires. We've actually, this is the third time I've been a part of council declaring um, uh, a disaster and a state of emergency. Um, so, but this fire was different this time. Um, and it hit the community a lot different than the Lodgepole and the Lindale fires in the, in the, in the previous um, history of the community. Um, it was it's absolutely devastating and I'm, I'm honestly I'm trying not to tear up um, it, it's still it still hurts um, my community is still hurting and we're still trying to to, to build um, we were very fortunate we only lost five houses in the community but um, the type of psychological damage when um, you're literally and I was with the residents um, I often to times people forget I'm a, as elected official I'm human too I have a family um, and when you were packing your bags, um, I was packing my bags too as well. Um, and I remember coming up to the intersection of Highway 22 and looking back at the town um, and in the community to the south of me and just seeing a wall of flames and a wall of smoke. Um, I, I, it, it, it's incredible. It's, it's, it, it's, it's hard to describe the fear, the pain. Um, and, and that feeling of uncertainty and in our community, I know it's been a few months, um, we're all back home, but it, it still lingers there. And I, I feel for communities that are going through that. Um, another big change that I've, I, I, I've seen shift in, in, in being there for 14 years is, you know, our, our revenue streams too, as well, the, uh, the, the constant downloading um, and the pressure from the provincial government that they're putting on um, 
on, on rural municipalities. Um, and I've been fortunate to um, experience um, two different, completely different sides of the partisan with, with, you know, having an NDP provincial government and with a UCP government. And one thing that I can tell you, um, being in my position, being nonpartisan, is both levels, uh, or both uh, parties, when in power, um, we're both putting um, constant pressure and downward downloading onto the municipalities. Um, and it's coming to a critical point. I know in my community, um, even with the pause in uh, the oil and gas uh, tax revenue that we can pull as a municipality, um, we're seeing between a four and $6 million hit every year. Um, and it's massive, absolutely massive. We're talking road projects, we're talking infrastructure projects that are getting pushed aside um, and having to be delayed because the funding is not coming in. And, um, you know, we're, we are on a critical tipping point right now. Um, I think even in my community on, on that funding level and that that concert downward pressure. Um, 14 years ago, I wasn't dealing uh, with with healthcare issues. It's a provincial mandate. It's um, it, it's in their portfolio, um, but I am spending um, countless hours, actually almost immeasurable hours and time on on trying to help my community in healthcare, um, trying to retain physicians, trying to recruit physicians into the community, trying to keep our hospital open and going. Um, we have a beautiful facility um, that's completely underutilized in the community. Um, and it's it's hard. It's it's it, hospitals are our heart and soul of our communities. And um, when you have your emergency room shut down, even for a small period of, you know, eight hours or an overnight period, it's it is it is detrimental to the community. So um, we're definitely seeing, um, like I said, I think the provincial downloading um, and provincial, what normally traditionally in the past were, were issues handled by the provincial government um, are not being addressed properly and they're, they were ending up on our laps. As of course, we are the, the government closest to the people. Um, I do grocery shop in my community. I, you know, get my vehicle fixed and serviced in the, in the, in the community. Um, uh, you know, I've ran a, a small oil field company um, uh, up until recently. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's, it's very frustrating from my point of view, seeing over the years, the, the pressures that are coming on, but it's a challenge too. And I also, I, uh, I, it's my passion too, when, when the challenge is set forth, um, trying to find and, and navigate your way through those challenges. And so it gets me up every day. <laughs> You talk about the jurisdictional roles, healthcare being a provincial uh, issue, uh, maybe housing or even social services being a uh, more provincial federal issue, but residents don't care. And I, and I say that with respect, they want, if they come to you with an issue, they want you to address it, whether it be a federal, provincial, or even municipal. In, in the last uh, few years, I have seen a blurring of jurisdictional roles that people understand. They don't understand that municipalities have a role to play, province has a role to play in the federal government because we're seeing downloading. Have you seen that locally where people are approaching you with more provincial or even federal issues compared to what the municipality is required and supposed to be working on? Absolutely. Um, and it's it's almost happening happening. Hap happening daily in my community um being a, a, a you know a young mom i'm 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 in the grocery stores i'm at the arena with my kids um and doing different sports in the after school and in the evenings quite busy um and and that you are you nailed it on the head that conversation um you know we might have touched on it 10 years ago and it was just a little bit of a conversation but right now that's it's it's dominating um it's it's actually interesting i'm finding provincial and federal issues are actually dominating the conversation rather than our actual municipal, a uh, little bit more local focus, um, focused issues. So it is, it's frustrating. And I, and I think it fell on our lap because um, municipal uh, elected officials, of course, are very much often more approachable. <laughs> um, and we're definitely in our communities a lot more. Um, and I do have, you know, we represent a smaller area too, as well. So, um, and it is frustrating and it's, you know, having that conversation, I'm a fixer. So when I get a problem and it, it's sent to me, I want to fix it right away. Um, and it is frustrating. I, I do lose, um, I do lose many nights of sleep over, over issues that honestly, that they, they are just outside of my control, but I will do everything that I can to push and try and help get some solutions to those problems, even though that they're out of my reach. But you say you're a fixer and I want to pick up on that word here because you know you can't do everything. You do not have an unlimited supply of money to fix everything. But there are certain things that you as a council, and I say you as a council, can do to alleviate some of the issues that people may have. 
Is there a weight that comes with that responsibility that you know that the decisions you make when you go into that council chambers, when you make a motion, when you pass a service level increase, when you pass a tax increase or not a tax increase, that it's going to impact your residents the day after you make it and you may hear about it at the oil change or at the grocery store? How much weight do you put on yourself to make sure you're doing the job correctly, but in not affecting people the most? It, it, it's a tremendous weight on, on my shoulders and my council's shoulder. And when we make decisions to um, increase fees or, or increase taxes, um, that being said, we haven't had any tax increase in my municipality. Um, inflation and uh, has, has looked after that. So I'm very fortunate that way. Um, but those discussions do happen. Um, and it is a tremendous weight because, like I said, oftentimes people forget um, or think elected officials sometimes, some, for some reason, are up on a pedestal and we're not. Like, you know, I, I am just an average day everyday lady in the community just trying to help my community um you know do better and be better tomorrow um and it is a tremendous weight i would be amiss if i didn't tell you i mean i lose i lose hundreds of hours of sleep and there's many many sleepless nights um in in my home um just worrying even about after 14 sleep. years even after 14 years. Actually, I think it's worse now than it was before because I think I have a better understanding and I've been around to see some of the diff the, the decisions and, and the impacts it does have on the community. And, and it does definitely um, hit me a little bit different when you've had that experience. And, you know, and I'm right in the thick of it. Like, you know, I, I have no problem sharing. I'm 39 and I've got three kids in the community. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just a mom. Um, and I'm, I'm just trying to make a difference in my kids' lives and trying to raise, you know, good human beings and at the same time help my community too at the same time. So, Is it hard it to is. balance that though? Because it I is. can imagine there's days that you just want to be Kara, just want to go play with your kids in the park or go to a restaurant or go out walking and not be inundated with issues that your community face. But you know, after 14 years, that you are counselor 24 seven, no matter where you are or what you do, you are the counselor. Have you struck a balance between being counselor and just being Kara and mom from time to time? Short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I am always mom and I'm always a counselor 365 days a year. And it doesn't matter if it's Christmas day, a birthday, I will step out and take a call and, and, and try my best to help my residents. And have your, you know, has can... your family adapted to that lifestyle? They have, you know what, it's, you know, I was out for dinner Friday night um, and actually I had another counselor from another community from Strathcona with me that evening. And I uh, actually had three different conversations in a matter of an hour with residents just approaching me at the table. But, you know, I honestly, I love it. And I, that's another part. I actually, I, 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 I really hold that near and dear to my heart that people feel comfortable even in those settings to come to me and, and say, Hey, you know, this is kind of give me a little nudge and say, this is what's going on. And, you know, and I always say like, I, I can't, I can't fix it right now, but I'll grab your name, your number. And I said, let me, let me work on it. And, you know, my staff are in on Monday. I know I'm here, but I said, you know, I probably might not get a response till Monday, but um, let me get on it right away. And that's the other piece is my administration and my staff in my, in, in my municipality are phenomenal. I will send you know, an email or a text on a Saturday and I always tell them, don't respond until Monday, you know, after eight o'clock when you're in the office, but they usually respond to me right away anyways. So it's, um, they're just as I think deeply passionate um, too about the work that they do in the communities that they're working in. So it's um, a very, very grateful that way. Um, and, and very, very humble with uh, working with staff like that too, so. One last question before I turn to the second segment here, and that's about apathy. I have noticed there's a big apathy. There's there's a massive apathy within municipal governments. People don't engage. People don't want to give their feedback. They they want to go to the sexy politics, the provincial politics, the federal politics, the partisanship. Municipalities are often forgotten about unless your water doesn't turn on or your garbage isn't picked up or your pothole isn't fixed in a timely manner. Municipalities are often forgotten. Do you find that? Um. In my community, I would actually disagree with that. I find um, my my rural residents are very engaged. Um, and um, I, I'll put it this way. If something's wrong, I usually know about it within five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I usually get a call. I get a DM on Facebook, like on social media. People are reaching out. I know what's, you know, you, you find out quite quickly what's going on and what the issues are. Um, and uh, they're quite engaged. And, and actually, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed um, in how engaged even provincially and federally um, that the residents are in our area. Um, and it's at the end of the day, it, it helps us make better decisions at the table when we're hearing from more residents and more different, more different points of view too. 
Um, and and it, it, at the end of the day, it's good governance. And um, uh, honestly, it it it, it helps in the, those decision makings when you hear from, you know, not the same five people or the same, you know, the the, the same ten people that show up to everything that always have an opinion on everything. Um, but I get I get random calls from people and uh, all the time actually, and it's just like, hey, did you know about this? This is what my thoughts are, and I always so appreciative to hear that because it is a different lens on a you know on on the issues that we're facing and. Um, it is difficult, you know. You get you you get elected in this role with what you knew in your background before, and you've got to be really willing to peel your lens off your own eyes and and like honestly open up the world and not stare at the world like this. And well, this is how it affects me. And it's um, when you take this role on in municipal, it isn't about you. And actually, um, you actually get forgotten about. I find quite a bit more because you have to think about everybody else before you think about yourself in this role. So. You bring up an interesting point about that echo chamber that some people find themselves in, particularly councils. People have social media, they engage with people that way. But you have to get a, a range of uh, uh, viewpoints from your residents because you have to make the ultimate decision. In those conversations where people have called you up, has it ever swayed you in a, a decision that you were thinking about making with an issue in front of council where you said, oh, this report seems pretty black and white, seems like I'm going to be able to vote for it. And then you hear from residents that go, oh, I didn't realize it was going to affect people this way. So maybe I should rethink it or ask a few more questions of administration or fellow councillors about these issues and see if they're hearing about the same thing that I'm hearing about. Absolutely. Um, you, you, I often, I joked even with someone dealing with some of our new elected officials as they come into the role. And I say, <laughs> I, actually, I tell them a story. I said, I'll walk in here thinking one way and then the public have had a chance to address something. And I'm like, oh, you know, I didn't think about it that way. You've got a great point. I'm actually going to change what I was, how I was going to vote by after listening to you. Um, and I think that's really key and really important in this role. And I know you often hear, um, cause I've been through four elections. It's like, oh, well you, you know, you waffled on this, on this topic and you changed your vote you know six months later and I said well you know what I did but six months prior I had this amount of information and um, six months later I had new set of information with a different lens and and, and different facts in it um, and facts that weren't available six months ago and absolutely okay call it waffling but yes you know what at least I listened and I changed my mind once I got you know got a little bit more educated on what was happening um, so I, I do push back because we do get accused of that. Oh, you're waffling on a on a on a decision. And I said, you know, no, you got to be really careful with that um, because, like, as new information becomes available, you absolutely need to be open minded enough to change your thought process and and how. I you know I said yourself. one question, and now yeah. we're like into three <laughs> questions later. But I'm in, I'm fascinated with this conversation. You know, you're not going to please 100 percent of the people, no. though. Yeah, and. I can imagine for someone who wears the weight of this responsibility that you have on your shoulders, that must put an added pressure on you that you know you're not going to please everyone. But there has to be a respectful dialogue that when you make a decision, you talk to people if they have questions or concerns. How do you balance that aspect of the job? Because people are about to start putting their name forward for their next election in two years in Alberta. People in Saskatchewan who might be listening to this are heading to the polls next year. And there are people out there who think, I'm going to be able to please 100% of the people, but you're not going to. How have you been able to balance the, the idea that you need to make the best interest for everyone, even if it upsets them? It's difficult, Chris, and I'm going to be honest with you. I've lost friends um, in the last 14 years that were, you know, considered childhood friends of mine um, because they, uh, you know, disagreed with uh, what I was doing and the decisions that I made. Um, and I, it would be a miss if I didn't tell you it affected me personally um, um, and, and mentally too as well. Um, I've, you know, lost family members that won't speak to me. Um, my, uh, our company in the past has lost contracts. Um, because, um, you know, oh, Kara made this decision around the, the council table. We don't agree with it. So we're going to yank this contract from your private company. Um, it, it happens um, and it's difficult, but you truly have to believe in yourself and believe what you're doing um, to keep pushing forward. And, and anybody facing that, I just, you know, you're not alone. Um, and that's one thing I, I, I felt early on, you know, probably the first term of being on council, I, I truly felt alone. I wasn't sure. And, and I kept a lot of it in because you don't want that, you know, that public judgment on you that you were struggling with, you know, how it was affecting you personally. Um, but what I have learned is I am not alone. Um, 
and probably this conversation and, and, and anyone listening is probably going to be able to relate to some of that. I know at some point and, um, you know, the difficult decisions and some of those uh, awkward circumstances you find yourself in council, um, you'd be amazed out there how many other council uh, councillors are going through that and are actually elected officials too at the same time. Might not be the exact examples I'm giving you, um, but they they all feel it too as well. And, you know, I often get, well, you're a woman and, you know, all those kinds of things. And I have to admit, you know, um, being a woman, um, and I've got a little, you know, I've got that. I actually, because being from rural Alberta, I, I don't mean to, it's hard for me to bring it up, but I, you know, doc, knocking on doors, well, well, what are you doing here? You should be at home raising your family because that's where you belong. And I, I pushed back a little bit and I said, you know, being a woman, I'm like, and being a mom and raising a family, I said, yes, but I bring that perspective to the table because guess what? I am cheap. <laughs> I am raising three kids and I take that, that, but that budgeting thought process to my council, um, you know, I was involved in an oil field company for over 16 years, you know, managing finances. And I'm like, by the way, I have small business background um, and, and trying to navigate an oil field company through three economic downturns and still standing at the end of the day. I mean, that that's no easy feat either. Um, and by the way, I'm still a mom and raising my kids who, you know, go all to these activities and stuff. And I said, I'm very proud of who I am as a woman, as a mom. Um, and that's what I bring to the table. I bring that passion and, 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 and that foot forward. And I often tell people, I said, I have a different lens. I'm like, when I make a decision, I think about my children and how's it going to affect them. Um, and I know some people on my council are like, you know, I've got, you know, a couple of years left, you know, oh, who cares? Right. And I said, whoa, stop the bus. You know, I've lived here for a long time and my kids are going to be here. And I do care about what the decision is. And you really need to think hard about what we're doing and the, the environment we're creating for them. So now it's, it's, it's interesting. Every day is interesting. <laughs> I, I want to turn to the second segment and I want to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. It's not a motion <laughs> of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion. Mm -hmm. For those who are about to send their emails, please don't. <laughs> please <laughs> don't. I, I really don't like responding to every single one saying the exact same thing I just said now, but here we are. Mm -hmm. Counselor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the facing Brazo County today? Um, honestly, Chris, I truly believe my community is wondering how they're going to pay their power bill, how they're going to put food on the table, um, and what the world's going to look like from a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. Um, everybody in my community is, and this is, this is hard to say coming from an oil and gas industry, a very strong community, um, you know, resource-based community um, who work for a living, who are very proud to work and very proud to have what they have. Um, but I am, I, I, there is a sediment in the community and it's, you know, I was in our food bank the other day. I was making actually a, a donation on behalf of a, of a organization I'm a part of. Um, and what they're telling me and, it, and it's, it's everybody, everyone is struggling right now. Um, inflation is hitting us, um, so hard. Um, it's incredible. Food bank is up 40 in my community alone. Um, my food bank usage is up 40% over this time last year. Um, never in the two volunteers that I was speaking with, had they ever had, um, oil field workers come in and need help, um, they are saying they have never seen the amount of working families. So that's where mom and dad or, you know, the, the working uh, adults in, in the household um, are coming and using the food bank. Um, and these are people with good paying jobs. Um, but with interest rates rising, um, I, 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 that is probably the biggest thing. And that is what's actually keeping me up. And it's one of those things. I know it's not a municipal issue, but it is a municipal issue. Uh, a lot of people in our communities um, uh our mortgages are going to be coming up here. I bet you in the next year to three years and with, you know, that are coming with a two, you know, 2.4, 2.7% interest mortgage rate on their, in, on, on their mortgage um, are now looking at five and 6% um, uh, mortgage rates. And what's that going to do? And, and, you know, power bills coming in. I just, I was actually just talking to, to a family and their power bill was $800 last month. Um, and they actually looked at their consumption and it was down from the previous year, but that's where the power, power prices are at. And um, that is what I think are the biggest thing in my community is going to be in the coming months. Um, Christmas is coming and I know people are already panicking about what Christmas is going to look like. Um, and this is coming from working, hardworking families and ha hardworking individuals in my community. Um, and I know. 
I, I'm going to ask the stupid million dollar question here, and I apologize if this comes across insensitive. This is not a, like you said, this is not a municipal issue, but there is a municipal aspect to this issue. You have just, you've said in the previous uh, conversation that the the county hasn't seen a tax increase. Inflation has kind of uh, dealt with that. But families who are struggling rely on services and they rely on libraries. They rely on FCFS. They rely on food banks, like you just said. And those are aspects that the municipality, the county can deal with. Those are the aspects that the county can sort of have a helping hand in. How do you do that? Because you you can yell into the void of provincial politics. Mm -hmm. You can yell into the extreme void of federal politics, but you have things you can do locally here. What do you see as your role as a council and you as a counselor to sort of help address some of these issues in the short term until we sort of hopefully see a light at the end of the tunnel? And that's it's it's a good question. And what we can do and control is actually we're heading into budgets here in the next month or so. And it's it's Woo, it's going to be, yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> but it's it, it's going to be having that frank conversation with the community. I know there's lots of asks out there, and there's a lot of wants, and I'll say wants. Um, and we're going to have to be really. Um, very transparent and very open and having those conversations about the needs versus the wants in the community right now. Um, and, and, and being able to focus on, on just provide, providing those key core services to, to residents. Um, that being said, I know we always talk about, you know, the, the property tax increase. Um, and I, I think we can do it. I know we've got the capability around my table and in with my administration to, to, to not have to do anything drastic like raise taxes, um, but come together as a group and really focus on what are the needs and what are the wants. Um, and then in those needs, look for those efficiencies um, and, and, and make sure we're being as efficient as we can and as, as best stewards as we can of the tax dollars that we're using um, to run those programs and make sure um, things are running top notch. And, and it, it is a struggle. It's, it's, it's hard um, and it takes a lot of brain power and, and a lot of will and a lot of hours to sit there and, and find those efficiencies. And I often tell you, you hear me talking efficiencies and people instantly are going, oh, you're going to let people go. And that's actually not exact. That's nowhere near what I'm insinuating. <laughs> when I'm, it's about going in and looking at the program. And look, are we doing it the most efficient route? Are we the, actually the best group to be offering that service? Is there somebody else there um, that has access to a different pool of money that we don't that could be offering that service instead? So, um, and it's about sitting down and you know what, and being quite frank with the public. Um, and, and I know in rural Alberta and in my community, we have no issues doing that and you know I, I'm often out having coffee with lots of residents and having those frank conversations um they're tough trust me they, it, it, it's hard it sucks um being yeah. able to tell and having to say something you know no that's not important right now and you know even though they feel quite passionate about something but explaining why it's not passion and sometimes like you said if I listen as I'm listening and they're telling me it actually may change my mind you know what you might got a, you know got a point there let's see if we can figure out how to financially make something happen but it is it's going to be it's going to be a really tough go um, so but... you, you talked about the needs and the wants, and I want to mm -hmm. pick up on that for a second, because I think that's an important aspect of this uh, conversation about the affordability. I think there's a third category that municipalities are looking at as well, and they're just not saying it openly. The needs, the wants, and the things that we've started, but we need to put off until a future date to sort of uh, help alleviate some of these issues because cost of uh, work has gone up, cost of uh, services have gone up, cost of goods have gone up. Is that a conversation that the county or even rural municipalities in general, and I know I'm speaking as a broad stroke here, but need to start having as well to say, until we sort of see a light at the end of the tunnel, we may need to put off that road project that is $20 million until two years. But I don't know if that $20 million road is now going to be $30 million road because we wait an extra two years. And you just, those conversations are happening. And I know projects did get bumped this summer. Um, and I know projects in, in, in my area got bumped too as well. Um, and, and, and going to be sitting down and having that, that relook at, at things um, in November too, and seeing, you know, can we bump it even, can we hold it off another year? We've got actually a couple paving projects and, and it, we've already heard in, in a council meeting, not even in our budget meetings. And it's, you know, can we, can we do, you know, can we, put chip seal on for now to buy us another five years. And hopefully when some of that tax money comes back from, 
the oil and gas industry after their tax holiday, um, then we can look at pool, pooling that money for a couple of years and going back and doing that project. Um, and, and our staff are phenomenal in giving us that information. Um, you know, I've got one road in particular. They said, you know what, you guys, if we don't fix this now, it's going to be instead of being an $8 million fix, it's going to be a $15 million fix. So, you know, in our professional and our background and keeping in mind, you know, the pressures that you're facing, we are telling you, you need to do this one. This has to get done or you're going to be facing a bigger bill at the end of the day. So great conversation. And it's part of that, you know, being elected official, um, trying to find that balance, but, but also taking into account and listening to our professionals that we hire to, to help run the organization from the administrative side. So it's that, it's about that teamwork, right? And so teamwork it, it, makes it, the dream work. It, it does. It does. So yeah, it's, I know I'm talking all doom and gloom, so I'm hoping we can so, kind of talk. So about we're, <laughs> we're, we're going to talk about some good things. Let's talk about what's go good going on in Brazo County, because you're right. There's always doom and gloom, but there's always the benefit. There's always the plus side and give me some, uh, a silver lining that not everything is doom and gloom in Brazo County. You know, one thing I always, I do a lot of traveling. I'm very fortunate um, with both my line of works. And I say with an S because I do have other jobs. Um, I do I do get to see a fair amount of the country um, in North America and in and, and particularly rural Alberta. And I honestly, and I know I'm going to sound so one-sided on this, but I do live in the, the most beautiful community in the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> and I have the best people surrounding my community and so fortunate for that. Um, so oil and gas, obviously, uh, it was down. It's it, it's part of the cycle. I'm used to it. I'm 39. I've been through, I think, well, I was too little to remember the 80s. Um, but we've been through since my kind of my adult and my teenage years. I've had three down cycles. And one thing I can tell you is when you're down, you can always pick yourself up and, and brush yourself off and, and do it again. So um, that's happening. Um, some really exciting things um, in our community is we are working with uh, several companies that are trying to be very innovative in the oil and gas industry. So um, we got one uh, company, it's called Recover. They're taking drilling uh, waste from uh, from drilling out in the oil patch. Um, and instead of putting it in class two landfills, they're recycling it up to 99% of it's being recycled. Um, groundbreaking, earth shattering, huge hurrah. It of course isn't sexy because it's drilling mud. <laughs> So you hear a little bit of, out, of it out in the media and stuff, but I don't think we're celebrating that enough, the innovation in the community. Um, another one we have is they're, they're uh, cleaning up and reusing uh, uh, wastewater, not wastewater, but wastewater from the oil and gas industry. Um, so we've got another company doing some really cool, innovative work there um, and a couple other companies looking into move in. They've got projects. Um, one's got projects in Germany and uh, Texas, and they're looking into my municipality for their one of their third projects um, in ge geothermal. So um, it incredibly exciting. That is one thing about um, my community. I know it's a buzzword right now, but I have never seen people who are more resilient um, than my community. Um, you know, you knock us down by wildfires, you knock us down with the oil and gas turn, um, but we're, we come back fighting and I think fighting harder every time we get knocked down. Um, and the sense of entrepreneurialism in my community is another reason I stay. I just, I love people's innovation. Um, I have, you know, very fortunate. Um, I have a young lady in my community. She literally works out of her basement. She runs um, one of the largest accounting firms in Canada. She's the lead for Western Canada and she works out of her basement and she happens to be in my division. Um, and you would never know she's there. And she's literally out there taking the world over in the accounting world. And she calls Brazu County home. And I'm, I just, I'm so fortunate. Um, it, it, it's the people that make my community. Um, and I, I, I couldn't, and I wouldn't live anywhere else. So I want to turn to a subject that's near and dear to my heart, because as you have toured most of Northern America and rural Alberta, I like touring as well. I like tourism. I think tourism is an aspect that municipalities need to do a better job at. That's just my own personal opinion, because I think every community has a hidden gem or something that can drive tourism to their community. And I want to ask you, because I'm going to be coming through Brazo, Brazo County here so hopefully in the next few next month or so, because I'll be coming up to the Edmonton area and making a pit stop to find your sign, to find your town hall. What should I do as a tourist or what should tourists do if they come to the county? Well, fingers crossed, we've got snow. We have some of Thank the, you. If, you, <laughs> if you cross country ski, we have the most beautiful trail system in all of Alberta. Um, believe it or not, I actually often say we are the best kept secret in my area um, outside of Banff and Jasper. So um, I will I will <laughs> proudly say that. 
um, we have, that's a one thing about our, our municipality is the majority of us are, it's still in the green zone, which is, you know, under trees. Um, we are the second um, community on the North Saskatchewan River. Um, so our river valley is, is pristine and pretty much um, untouched. And actually, if you do see a little bit of activity down there, it's done so well um, and so environmentally conscious um, what's going on down there. But our river valley is stunning. Um, some of it's a little burnt at the moment from the, from the spring, but it's still gorgeous down there. Um, we have campgrounds, um, probably wrong time of the year for it, but we have some of the most beautiful and I stay in BC, trust me, I'm like, I love camping. Um, you, you'd be hard pressed to find more beautiful campsites than, than what are in my community. Um, we have one Wiley West, it's right, um, right off of highway 22, actually right near the bridge. Um, and it's a gorgeous, gorgeous, uh, uh, campground to be in, um, the Brazu Dam um, is another highlight for us that you should take a drive out there. You can literally, you are on the dam when you drive on the road um, and it actually is a power source in the province. I don't think um, everyday Albertans are quite aware of um, that's in my backyard. Um, if all the power plants were to go down in the province, it's my dam and in, in my area that actually restarts the province's power grid up. Um, so it's kind of cool, kind of unique. Um, that and is it's absolutely massively gorgeous. unique. It is. And it's been really cool. We have a fantastic partnership with the province, uh, with Transalta and, and the county. Um, and there's, again, there's day use areas out there. There's campgrounds out there. Um, and we do it all in conjunction with private industry, with the province and our, our municipality. So I'm really proud of that. Um, the drive is amazing. I've, I've learned a lot. There's a, a motorcycle, motorcycle group out there that I didn't know about because I'm not into motorcycling, but they come out from the cities, um, Edmonton and in the surrounding area, and they do a loop through our community through uh, Cynthia Lodgepole, um, secondary highways. Um, so it'd be um, you come down off of 16 and you turn towards Cynthia. Um, that drive is absolutely stunning. I can guarantee you you're going to see moose, elk, bears, you name it, you're going to see. Maybe not this time of the year, the bears are starting to go to bed, but um, it's a beautiful drive. Um, and then you cut through, you come out at the dam, and then you kind of loop back up through Drayton, and they've got little stops along the way. Um, and I agree with you. I don't think rural Alberta does enough to promote their tourism. Um, there are little gems uh, everywhere like that. And and it's it's just, I'm really proud of our, our, our cross-country ski trails. We have ATV trails actually in a provincial park that are sanctioned um, that have been worked on with the province and our local ATV groups that are, are, are amazing. Uh, we have horse trails. If you are into horseback riding, we have, again, probably some of the most beautiful trails in all of the province um, that are uh, kind of that best kept secret kind of scenario. Um, those trails with the horses uh, run along the Pemina river and i believe they have over 80 kilometers now of trail systems put in um along the, the along the pemina river and if that river is beautiful too at this time of the year it's low so you can actually pretty much anywhere walk right across it so it's 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 a cool cool unique um uh experience to do that too so and where do you yeah, go there's sorry where do you go in the county? Where do you go to just decompress after a long day of being mom, after a long day of being counselor, after a long day of being a, just a worker? Where do you go to just let it all go and just recenter yourself because you know tomorrow is another day and you're going to have to get back at it and just do the exact same thing and try to solve the world's issue at a local level? Two things. I hop in my car, being in rural Alberta, you got to drive everywhere. Um, and actually driving and just hitting the back roads and honestly getting lost in my, in, out in, out in the wilderness and out in the farming country, taking, you know, oil and gas lease roads and just seeing where you, where you end up. And it, it always brings me and grounds me back when you see just how beautiful the community is. And that's what, that's what I'm there fighting for. I'm there to keep our community great and whole. Um, and, um, if it's a nice warm day, I don't like cold. <laughs> so if it's a warmer <laughs> day, um, with a jacket, you'll hear the Pemina Nordic ski trails. So in the summer they're open for walking trails, um, and they follow along the North Saskatchewan river. And it's absolutely stunning, absolutely stunning and, and a, a, a good place to ground. Um, and if you're coming from the Edmonton region, uh, we're less than an hour from the city. And I, again, I just, I, I don't think we do enough to promote what's in the area. Um, COVID was interesting. That was actually, we seen an, everybody, you know, was in their houses and I don't think they were because I think they were all in my county and they're all on all my trail systems and you know bumping into people um I'm like oh where are you from oh we're from Spruce Grove oh we're from Edmonton and we just you know we were out online and the, the online community was chatting about how to get out and, and and get back to nature and um and uh so that was really cool 
Amazing. you see a boom from COVID? Did you see a boom like people wanting to move to your county as well because they wanted an escape from the hustle and bustle of a city? And because you're so close, people are saying, hey, let's look at Brazo County and see if we can find a house who, with a lot more acreage and a lot more playground. Yes. And you know what? Very quietly, I can say, yes, we are seeing an influx. Actually, we're seeing an influx of residents coming from Ontario and BC into our community right now. Um, and a lot of them I'm talking to are from suburbs or or urban centers. And um, uh, they're looking for that lifestyle change. Um, our cost of living, obviously, now I'm talking countrywide, our cost of living in Alberta is the lowest right now um, in the country. So we're seeing that influx. And, and Brazu County is... Um, we're definitely uh, seeing that benefit in the community. So um, it's interesting in itself brings its own com complexity. It's it's teaching them, okay, now you're not in the city. You don't have garbage pickup every week. You actually have to take your garbage to to a specific site. Um, and uh, and it's great. It's great getting to know them, getting to know their experiences. Um, and I think our community is going to be better. Uh, we will be a better community having people like that come in and, and, and bring those for different perspectives to the world. But it is, it's neat. And we are seeing it very quietly. I talked to our local realtors um, and I'm actually blown in a way how many people we're we're seeing coming from out of province moving into our area so that's awesome so i want to leave on the million dollar question i think it's a question that every municipal politician needs to know how to answer i think they know how to answer it but i like putting it on the record so for you what do you believe that, well sorry i should I, i'm going to rephrase it here it's the same question just going to rephrase it a little bit in your opinion what makes brazo county such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family I truly believe it's the people in my community um, that make the community. And I, I had said it before, the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit in my community, um, the welcoming you with open arms, um, you know, if you're down, uh, you don't even need to say you're down in our community. Someone's right there beside you, giving you a hand up, um, not a handout, but a hand up. Um, I, I, I just, I couldn't be more proud. I, I actually, this, this, this past Friday night, we have a, a young mom in our community who lost her husband to cancer. Um, and again, I'm going to get emotional. I love my community. Um, over 500 people turned up um, to let that mom know she's not alone. Um, and I see that time and time. That's just one of examples of, of hundreds that I see in our community. Um, and the, it, it is truly the people in the community that make our community what it is today. Um, they are the hardest working individuals um, that I've ever come across of. Um, and, and like I said, if you are down, they're there to help you. Um, and it's beautiful. Um, you come out to our area, um, there's trees, there's farmland, like we've kind of, we've kind of got it all. It's that, you know, that the whole thing you can see on a clear day, you see the mountains from my community. And, you know, we've got two amazing river systems. Um, you know, if you're into quadding, we can we can accommodate that. If you're into walking and, and, and cross-country skiing, we can accommodate all of that. And and we've got groups in the community. That's the other unique part. All this all this stuff that goes on in the community, it's the public and the and the people and the residents that make it happen with the volunteering um in those committees. And it is it is truly amazing. And I would I cannot wait till you come out. Um, and I sure hope you give me a shout because I would love to show you around our community and, and, you know, maybe I can convince you to move out. <laughs> hey, if you can convince a certain partner of mine to do that, I will happily do that. I miss the rural living because I, I originally from, well, not originally, but I lived in Big Lakes County for some time and I would move back in a heartbeat to the county because it was one of the best experiences of my life, just living and sort of being away from it, the hustle and bustle of it all. So that's my love it. And plot. I'm going to challenge any rural municipal elected official. I don't care if you're from Alberta or what, what, what province let's convince Chris and his family to move back out to rural Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, but I will certainly look you up. I, I want to make sure because it is, it's been on my bucket list to get out. And every time that I'm about to, I either get stopped or another politician, another municipal leader takes, 12 hours of my time when I was expecting to only be four so here we well, are and here we are to see our time too as well we probably could talk for another hour <laughs> there you go but I want to thank you so much Kara for doing this greatly appreciate it um and I say thank you a lot but I say this respectfully to every single time I say it thank you for serving thank you for serving your community I can imagine the issues you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis would probably just 
compound an average person, but you are stronger. You are a person who is seems to be doing it for the right reason, which is community. So I want to thank you so much for serving your community, for being part of your community, and for talking about your community on the show today. So thank you. Well, and you know, Chris, thank you. Um, it's it's truly appreciated. And I can't thank you enough uh, for what you're doing and the connections and the stories that you're getting out because I think uh, you play a key and very important role in what I do and what elected officials do across um, Alberta and across this country. So I'm going to put it back on you and and thank you um, for your dedication and uh, and for the work that you're doing and um, just getting our stories out there um, and making those connections and, and, and building those relationships and, and building bridges because that's what it's all about. So thank you. So I'm going to do a little shameless plug here, but I'm going to say, um, let's grab a coffee while we're at RMA next uh, month. For those who are listening from RMA, get back to me. <laughs> I think we'll have uh, quite a few coffees. I would, I'm would. i very open to coffee. So <laughs> it's my jam. It's what keeps me going after I told you all the sleep that I lose. I, coffee is my best friend. <laughs> me too. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, Stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.